<laughs> oh, if he had something to eat, he's real eager to go through his, all his tricks for a little biscuit or something. But I'd like to know a bit about how you balance your own farming operation with your responsibilities as supervisor of a larger operation. Do you well, just uh, naturally <coughs> grow, grow out of... It makes it easy in some respects because uh, not only am I located real close to my the ranches that I supervise. Mine is nested right in the middle of them, so to speak. Uh, so I'm I'm around my ranches in the process of supervising other at my the uh, company that I work for. So. Uh, and the other thing is that, that because the crops are similar, if you solve a pest problem on peaches on one crop, you can you use that same information and same knowledge uh, to schedule it on another. And so it's, it's, it's easier to do it. So it simplifies my operation, takes less time for, the, for my part, and so they're, they're isn't a conflict. Someone was telling us today that it's very difficult for a, far, a farmer with a limited size operation to keep up with all the new things going. Well, it is, and uh, uh, this is one of the problems with small operations. Of course, I, uh, and equipment comes in here. It's not only the know-how, but also the equipment that it takes to do the job. Now, our family operation is fairly small, but I have uh, my uncle just a quarter of a mile from my operation has something similar. So we have, uh, we have purchased equipment together. And uh, by doing this, we can, we can use one tractor to do the, the job that otherwise we'd have to have two. So we, we by co cooperation, we afford the equipment that we couldn't otherwise afford. And in the matter of uh, forklifts, I mean, that's an important piece of equipment now with the methods of handling uh, fruit at harvest time. Well, I have a brother-in-law that's in citrus and uh, olives. And so the three of us, my uncle and my brother-in-law, and I have gone in. Now our crops are, luckily, uh, don't overlap to the extent where uh, we all three need the forklift at the same time. So we have managed to, to buy an expensive piece of equipment that small farmers can't have. And uh, I use it and pay my share of the cost and expenses and maintenance and all. And, Do you uh, see many small farmers cooperating together in this way? or? No, it's, it's not the usual thing uh, as we've done it. Some of them do it through a, maybe a marketing or packing house operation. It's more expensive that way, and it's more difficult to, to feel a personal control. Something you said this morning made me curious. You said that your deep religious beliefs in your faith gave you a different approach to uh, any problems to do with your farming or labor relations. I, could you explain that a little to me? Well, uh, I think that it makes you realize that people are people and that, that uh, you must consider them as individuals and worthy of the dignity and respect and, and uh, where they may have limitations. Uh, some of these limitations uh, are part of them and you accept them and uh, you sorry where they fall short of meeting maybe the standards of production or the ability related to education and these things, but uh, more and more you view them uh, 
and respect them and appreciate them for what they are. <coughs> and uh, in a sense that you, I mean, you have a more of a desire to to deal with them on these terms and perhaps uh, sacrifice a little bit on the the uh, <coughs> value uh, in dollars and cents and production wise. <coughs> Some of this comes because we I mean, we must compete in farming uh, because if we don't produce efficiently, well we're dropped out. I mean our farms are consolidated or, or change, the crop has changed or something has changed. So I think uh, this perhaps uh, makes me look more at the individual for what he is rather than what he he does uh, on the ranch solely. I, I appreciate his problem more. Most farmers uh, recently anyway have never been in the position of the, of the farm worker is now. We've been there as, as a when we grew up, I mean, we picked peaches and we thinned peaches and we pruned and we've been through this routine ourselves uh, way back when and when it was rougher. I mean, if you come through the depression years and all, and I've worked for 20 cents an hour and and I've picked plums in the summer to earn a little money and uh, and even at the time that we had our own small place. But uh, we lose sight of these these problems uh, that are real with people today, and so we class them. And uh, this, I mean, this is, uh, I don't know if that's an example of prejudice. Uh, uh, at least it's, it's not seeing the individual, it's seeing uh, people as a group and a, Signing a personality to a group, and the individuals don't always fit that. Or the one of race is, uh, to a large extent, one of um, background and social um, rearing, a uh, social uh, uh, standards, and uh, oh, those kind of things. Realize what kind of a background that a lot of the Mexican people come from. I've associated with a fine Mexican family for a number of years and uh, had them work f for me and, and gotten along real well. But of course we don't. I mean we don't uh, see things from their point of view. We don't feel the the discrimination if it's there. Uh, we don't understand, uh, and, and language is a real barrier to communication of feelings. And we've had uh, uh, the father-in-law of the Mexican family that I know real well was here and visited, and uh, just the inability to communicate, no matter how warm you wanted to feel toward him, you couldn't put it across. I mean, you ride for miles and not a, not able to say things, and and. Uh, this this is a barrier and a source of misunderstanding. We assume that they're just like us, in as much as they have the ability to deal with other people and with situations and solve problems. Of this this they they don't have, and yet we say, well, uh, the police are for your production just like it is for us. Or you can go to talk to the judge and explain why you can't do this or that, and and uh, they don't. They don't have these contacts. I mean, uh, I feel free to to uh, go into the local justice court and and uh, argue, uh, argue or just discuss it. But some people that I know uh, that they're even afraid to go in and take care of a traffic ticket. They they don't like this relationship with people that we think are part of our uh, in for our benefit and, and uh, societies uh, so that uh, I, I know a family that uh, that 
came from Mexico and, and didn't have these uh, advantages that, that we have, and they're very appreciative of the opportunities afforded them. They want to they want to conform to our way of doing things and take advantage of, of the opportunities that they have, and they're very honest and, and ambitious. But they don't have some of the discipline. They, they believe too much. Uh, I mean, the advertising, for instance, of uh, credit and borrowing money and easy financing and this kind of thing. And uh, uh, they almost view it as a child would be offering candy. They don't see the, the harmful or the trap that it gets you into. And nobody there is going to tell him until it begins to fail to make the payments. And then the first thing you know, there's a check attachment and harassment and that nature. And so we say, well, he's, the law says he can charge his 1.5% uh, per month. And that's 18% interest per year or in, in the smaller amounts, the two and a half, which is 36%. And who of us will go out and pay 36% interest on two, up to $500 and think we're getting a bargain uh, and uh, that he's offered us something real good to loan us uh, $400 at 36% interest. And if you don't pay it, then uh, there's a check attachment and there's no dealings with him because I've argued for some of these uh, people that I know with these people, and they're pretty hard-hearted when you get down to it. And, and uh, I have the confidence of my position, but they have no position to argue for, argue from. My children take for granted they'll go to college. We don't discuss and we don't argue with it. I mean, they take it for granted because we went to college. But uh, other, uh, other families just don't assume this. The children don't absorb it naturally. And uh, my son uh, pointed out an instance in elementary school where two, uh, two of the students were comparable. But the, the one from the poor family didn't have the work right work habits at home they didn't have the privacy for study didn't have the encouragement to do things on time or the regular attendance so they fall behind and this starts way back early and it's it's more of a feeling that you get from your cultural background the defeating what would you say if the president of the u.s of a said farmer montgomery what can you do in your little patch of the woods to start on some of the problems that beset our nation? Well, of course, you immediately think of doing it on a big scale, and this is the answer. Let's create a big program. But the real answer is between individuals. I mean, the individuals that I contact is where, where I start and where I'm most effective. And uh, my concern and feeling for them so I, I think rather than look for big programs, what we have to go back is go back to the person-to-person -person relationships. 